Welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm your host, Paul Hodes, with my co-host, Matt Robeson. We're broadcast on WKXL AM and FM and podcast wherever it is you find your podcasts. Well, in the last few years, we've seen ideas that were once on the far fringes of American political thought become some of the most important and, frankly, frightening factors in our politics in the future of our country. The idea that the very existence of our democracy would hinge on the obscure Electoral Count Act of 1887 would have seemed far-fetched until January 6, 2021. But as we record this show, a bipartisan group of U.S. senators is working at a fever pitch to fix it before it becomes our undoing in the next presidential election. A few years back, the idea that an internet conspiracy theory would consume one of the two major political parties in America would have seemed like a kind of crazy Hollywood plot. But in recent weeks, Donald Trump has explicitly adopted the sig- symbols, language, and even the theme song of the QAnon movement. And if you had told me when I was serving in Congress a decade ago that there was a stealth plan underway to radically rewrite our Constitution under a far-right agenda, I would have said lots of nuts have lots of crazy ideas. But today, prominent legal scholars are saying we need to pay attention because this plot is making headway, and before long it could be the most dire threat to the American political system that we have yet faced. Our guests today are the authors of a new book about the threat, The Constitution in Jeopardy. Former U.S. Senator Russ Feingold served nearly two decades in the U.S. Senate. He co-authored the McCain-Feingold Act, governing how we fund political campaigns, and he sat on the Senate Judiciary Committee, chairing its subcommittee on the Constitution. He's taught at Stanford, Harvard, Yale, and Marquette Law Schools. He's now president of the American Constitution Society, the nation's leading progressive legal organization, and an affiliated scholar of the Stanford Constitutional Law Center. His previous book, While America Sleeps, A Wake-Up Call for the Post-9-11 Era, was a New York Times bestseller. And for those of you who are seeing this uh, by video, it is featured prominently over Matt Robeson's right shoulder. His co-author is Peter Prindeville, a non-resident fellow at the Stanford Constitutional Law Center and an attorney based in Washington, D.C. He previously was a fellow on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Gentlemen, I want to welcome you both to Beyond Politics. It's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having us on the show. Thanks for having us. So let me plunge right in. Larry Sabato, who is the director of the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia, offered this comment about your book, and I quote, Feingold and Printable expose the underbelly of a national movement to overhaul the United States Constitution and radically change the nature of our democracy. Tell us what Professor Sabato is talking about. Is the what he's talking about is the movement to convene a constitutional convention under an obscure provision of the Constitution. So let's start with this question. What is an Article 5 constitutional convention, and how is it different than the way we usually think about changing the Constitution? Well, Professor Sabato invited us down last week for a wonderful visit in Charlottesville, where we, we had a chance to kind of go over this. With, with the students and people that were there at the great uh, Jefferson Society at the University of Virginia. And the first thing we did, of course, is answer your question, which is, you know, there are two ways to amend the Constitution under Article 5. One, many people are pretty familiar with, which is you get two thirds of each house to vote to propose certain language for an amendment. And then that's sent by the Congress out to the states. Uh, where either by convention or by a state legislative vote, three quarters of the states have to approve that in order for there to be a constitutional amendment. That's only happened 27 times in American history. But the other mechanism is just as legal. It's right there in, in Article 5 in the Constitution. It's never been successfully employed. But it says that if two thirds of the states, 34 states now, uh, apply to have a constitutional convention, Congress is obligated to call that convention. The problem though, and the reason that uh, Peter and I and Professor Sabato and others are concerned is not just that there may or certainly are extreme people supporting this, but that there are 
really no rules for how this would run. I think Peter has a good comment on that. So, right. So we've never held a convention under Article 5. And it's our concern isn't that there's a movement attempting to amend the Constitution. Constitutional amendment is fundamentally legitimate. Uh, and it's important in a functioning and flourishing constitutional democracy. The problem with the Article 5 convention mechanism is that there are no rules about how it functions. We don't know how it would work. And um, James Madison remarked uh, uh, towards the end of the Constitutional Convention in his notes, which are generally regarded as the you know, preeminent source of what occurred at the 1787 Convention. He remarked that the Article 5 Convention mechanism was flawed because there weren't, in his words, sufficient constitutional regulations dictating how it should work. And so in this vast void of uncertainty can rush uh, extreme theories about how the convention functions. And we worry that, that there could be theories that work uh, to make a convention radically malapportioned and designed to meet the needs of, of uh, some far right elements of American political life. Can I just Go follow ahead, up? Please. I just want to follow up. So, so why did the framers um, have uh, put in Article Five. Why are there these two different methods? Um, and and what what do Madison's notes uh, tell us about about that? Well, our Constitution is an amazing thing. It was the first real written national constitution in history, and certainly the first one to have a formal amendment mechanism. And that's as we write in our book is that. You know, the founders and the people of this country had just gone through a terrible battle. There was blood all over the place from the revolution, and they were looking for what uh, some referred to as uh, the opportunity for a bloodless revolution, the opportunity to change that fundamental document. And so um, they went to Philadelphia, and uh, actually the first proposal, the Virginia plan that kicked the thing off, would have allowed no congressional role. There would have just been probably a convention mechanism. And they went back and forth over that hot summer. And uh, till near the end, a proposal came out to continue, maybe to let the Congress call the convention, but again, not Congress proposing amendments, but a certain guy named Alexander Hamilton objected. Or the national government has to be the convention mechanism. He favor that nine to one. But then George Mason and some of the others said, you know, basically we're out of here. If you don't, if you don't deal with this, and if you don't give us the another option, which is a, a convention type option. So in the end, a compromise was forged. But as Peter pointed out, the rules are real clear about a congressional amendment, but there are basically no rules about a convention. But it was a compromise between two very different visions of what amending should be. You know, Senator, as you were just describing, and as Peter was describing a moment ago, kind of this open vacuum of what the rules could be and what could happen if there were a new constitutional convention. I could just sort of picture nefarious forces out there tenting their figures and saying, excellent. It, it seems like this is sort of an opportunity for all kinds of craziness to ensue. Uh, to ensue. What do we know about who's behind the push to use this obscure part of uh, of, of the Constitution to convene a new convention. What's their agenda, and why are they interested in using this mechanism to get what they want? Well, we know that um, it's it the, the this movement is is lavishly funded by common far right elements um, that you know are, are common am amongst these kinds of movements: the Koch brothers, the Mercer family, and the like. And it's attracted kind of a who's who of the contemporary right and far right establishment. Uh, the primary organization leading the movement is run by Mark Meckler, the founder of the Tea Party Patriots. Uh, Senator Rick Santorum was recently brought on last year as um, uh, a, an advisor to the movement. And so it's attracted kind of these common household names. And in terms of uh, why, why is there so much run, money rushing to the movement and why is it attracting these, these, these names? Um, well, clearly they see potential. And part of that potential 
is this vacuum within the Article 5 mechanism. And you know, there are theories being put forward now uh, that we would dispute as legal matters, but they're being put forward nonetheless, that an Article 5 convention is actually a convention of the states, meaning that when the convention meets, every state gets one single vote. So it's radical in their vision, Article 5 endorses a radically malapportioned understanding of constitutionalism. And because of the contemporary you know, lay of the political land, they see opportunity in this malapportionment. And that their view about the nature of an Article 5 convention and how the convention would actually function in practice is by no means a settled matter, yet they are creating this new theory and putting it forward to state legislators as settled fact in an attempt to, to, to call this, this convening that would be advantageous to their interests. And if we want to guess, ask, well, what is it they want to do now with this void, this opportunity? We don't have to guess. One of the titles of one of our, one of our key chapters is what Trump and the Tea Party couldn't do. It's literally a quote from one of these folks. And Santorum refers to this opportunity as like having a hand grenade. You just have to pull the pin. It doesn't sound like, uh, you know, getting together and thinking about what the best thing is for the country. And um, as we've written in the book, there's a detailed account of how carefully they're preparing for this. They had, they've had a number of mock conventions, one in uh, Williamsburg in 2016, where they spent several days carefully debating proposing, arguing, and voting on certain provisions. They are training state legislators and others to be delegates, while progressives and moderates and moderate conservatives and thoughtful conservatives aren't engaged in this. And they, they showed us what they would do. They would pass uh, amendments that would severely curtail the power of the federal government to do many of the things they can already do, things like trying to fight COVID. They would severely restrict some of our, the powers of our administrative agencies, particularly ones like the Environmental Protection Agency. They would make the income tax illegal, even though we have a current constitutional amendment that makes it legal, they would override that. And, and apparently their favorite is to allow 30, 30 states to be able to vote through their state legislatures, presumably, to overturn any federal law or any federal regulation. So this is, you know, we talk about election subversion, this is constitutional subversion, but it's it's legal. That that's the point Peter and I need to make here. This isn't like January sixth. This is a legal mechanism. And you know, your Senator, your answer reminds me that um, uh, here in New Hampshire, there there's already legislation that, um, for example, is uh, trying to prevent any federal gun legislation from uh, overriding a, a state legislation, basically saying, we don't need any federal gun legislation here, and we're going to try to stop it uh, by legislation. So this is a it, it it's a it's a pretty extraordinary agenda. And we can only imagine from what we've seen so far from the far radical right, what uh, kind of mischief they would want to do to our constitutional scheme. So it, it sound, you know, it sounds like this has been going on for years. It also sounds like moderates in the left have been asleep and not paying real attention. So thank you for your book. And I guess my question is, how likely is this to succeed? And uh, wouldn't a constitutional convention still be merely proposing amendments that would still have to be ratified? Is it more expansive than that? Or do we have any idea um, how, how, how it would work? I mean, I have this image of of 50 people from the 50 states getting into a room and doing away with really important parts of what makes our country work. Well, I, I think first about um, how likely is it, um, it can be quite challenging to assess because the primary element of calling the convention are these applications. The constitution provides no guidance about how these applications should be counted. And there's a wide array of differing theories about, about you know, how they are to be submitted and the like. But 
I think all you need to know, and we argue in the book that although the constitution makes it clear that the, the calling the convention is a ministerial act, Congress must do it when the threshold has been satisfied. There's so much uncertainty about how to actually do the process of counting that it's an inherently political act. And so all you have mm-hmm. to do is, is look at, at, at recent, at the last few months, a, a resolution was recently introduced in Congress claiming that the threshold had been satisfied and that now Congress must call the convention. A lawsuit was filed, um, I believe in the Southern District of Texas recently, claiming the same, that, that the threshold had been satisfied and that, the, that a judge should order Congress to call the convention. Mm. And so, you know, how likely is it? We'll need to see, but it's important for, for concerned citizens to be, be watching this and also for concern, concerned state legislators to be watching this as well, because a lot of the counting theories that have been put forward over the last few, few years are taking a number of states along for the ride. They're using applications passed in history in the current count. And so concerned state legislators in states that might be opposed to this movement need to be watching and rescinding some of these applications and being quite vocal in their opposition. Yeah, we're concerned not only uh, about the possibility of a far right attempt to un- un- undo the Constitution, but we write a fair amount in the book about that there may well be a constitutional crisis coming here. And this is what Peter was really getting at. So, yeah, for strategic reasons, some of the other, you know, there's different groups doing this. The Convention of the States people may not want to act right away. But the resolution that Peter referred to by Representative uh, Jody Arrington of Texas, you know, they could vote on that in January. If the Republicans take over the House, they could say, there's enough signature, there's enough applications here. And then the reason it becomes constitutional crisis is what Peter was just alluding to. Who could stop it? Basically, no one. The Supreme Court would probably not touch it, not just because of who's on the Supreme Court, but because the Constitution really does not invite them and their own doctrines of judicious justiciability and political question doctrine would probably preclude them from doing. So all of a sudden, you could have this convention call that we think is is based on on phony math, as they used to say. Um, And then all of a sudden, it could be off to the races. And we may have a question of legitimacy in this country. Is that a legitimate process or isn't it? And there's really no way to resolve it, which is kind of stunning. And it goes back to the failure of the founders to give us rules. So just to read that back to you for a second, and also to tie back to where Paul started us, it seems like the very uncertainty is the issue here. And we've seen copious examples in recent years of what seemed like fringe ideas, fringe political ideas, fringe legal ideas, suddenly coming very much to the fore. We're seeing this right now before the Supreme Court in the form of independent state legislature theory, which if the Supreme Court rules in in favor of kind of the right wing position on this, could fundamentally remake how we do elections and, and how we recognize the power of state legislatures and the power of the federal government. And it sounds like your point, uh, Senator and, and Peter, is that we just don't know. There's, as Al Gore famously and clumsily said, there's no controlling legal authority here. And so we could very much end up in a schism. I, I, I don't mean to dunk on the former vice president, who's I, I love the man. But, you know, it, we could really end up in a situation quite realistically here where there is a powerful political movement in favor of of a constitutional convention, there's some kind of authority like the House of Representatives that deems it as being a real thing. And there's a question, there's an open question, and there really is no way of resolving it. And now we're in a constitutional crisis. Now we really don't have a way forward. Yeah, I mean, a constitutional crisis is bad enough. But when you have a constitutional crisis in the midst of a situation where there are many groups and advocates in this country who are trying to undermine our democracy, this plays right into their hands. Having a constitutional crisis is the thing that would allow them to assert the, frankly, sometimes fascist notions that, that are being put forward in some schools. And I'm not saying everybody that's for the convention is like that, but it would create a void, another void where that kind of thinking could go forward. One of the things that that brings up is something you've alluded to, both of you, 
uh, already in this show, which is the miracle that we have a constitution at all. That there, there's actually a wonderful book about this called Miracle of Philadelphia by Catherine Drinker Bowen. It's another one of the books that's featured over my right shoulder, uh, along with uh, Senator, your previous book. And it really shows what a mess the original constitutional convention was and what a, a, a compromise it ended up being between diametrically opposed forces. It kind of leads me to maybe a challenging question to your to your thesis here. In writing about your book, The Bulwark noted that it's not irrational to suppose that a second constitutional convention composed of women as well as men, people whose families came from outside Northern Europe, LGBT citizens and people poor as well as rich and of all walks of life would write and send to the states for ratification a different document than the one that now orders our public affairs. I guess my question to you is, might it not be better, considering that the original Constitutional Convention featured disagreements between slaveholders and abolitionists, between agrarian societies and industrialized societies, some of our differences nowadays don't seem quite as as yawning um, and, and, and different. I, might a Constitutional Convention actually be a good thing? Well, of course, constitutional, formal constitutional change can be a good thing, of course. And, and that's a core element of our book. It's why we end the book the way we do, looking at reform. Um, the whole, our whole thesis is both a warning and a way forward. But what's important here is thinking about the process of a convention convened under Article 5. It, we can't just think about substance all the time. We have to think about the process of it. And so the of course, if you had a convention that truly reflected the broad diversity of the country, it is quite possible that the document that is drafted by such a convening um, you know, would, would be more potentially more fit for the needs of, of modern society. But there's no certainty that the convention would actually look like that. Uh, and so our, our core thesis is that formal constitutional change is a good thing. And we should be having public debates uh, as a first order matter about the nature of the constitution and about its role in public life. But we must pair, we must create a system and a procedure that channels public debate towards those high, high ideals of constitutional reform. And so the last part of our book, as I said, looks at reforming article five itself. How can we actually change the procedure for formal constitutional change to make it such that the people could, in the 21st century, uh, engage these, these high questions in a way that is both uh, safe, but also productive for a modern democratic constitutional society. And we feel very strongly that the idea behind this constitution that we live under is not we the states, it says we the people. And unfortunately, the approach that these folks that are pushing this or we're trying to use is a we the states approach. They want to have amendments that are voted on be voted on one vote per state. That's how they did it at this mock convention in Williamsburg. So it would be grossly gerrymandered and malapportioned. Mm -hmm. You know, think about the Electoral College on steroids. So the idea that somehow you know, some good stuff will come out of this it is exceedingly unlikely if they, they pull this stunt. Now, as Peter says, we do think that we desperately need some constitutional change and will be needing it. But we say that Article 5 needs to be amended. Congress needs to change the amendment mechanism. We have the hardest constitution to amend in the world. It's one of the reasons we've only had 17 amendments since the Bill of Rights. And so creating a way to do this, where it would be more based on popular vote or popular votes of a certain number of states combined with a popular vote, and also putting some rules in the Constitution for this thing about how applications are supposed to be counted, about whether you can limit the topics, um, which seems to be reasonable. Um, those are the changes that we would have. Now, of course, that would require two-thirds vote of both houses and three quarters of the states, but we think we're in a terrible bind right now. I mean, if the choice is between a gerrymandered right-wing convention and never fixing the constitution, that can't be sustained. 
Mm-hmm. Well, it does remind me very much, just to follow up on that, of the position we're in with the Electoral Count Act right now, where the uncertainty and the fact that we're kind of stuck with a broken mechanism is in itself the problem. It, so just to follow up on, on what that fix might look like, and I'm wondering how much you agree with a recent article in The Atlantic titled The Constitutional Flaw That's Killing American Democracy from Duke Law Professor Jed Britton Purdy. And he writes that the Constitution is too fundamentally anti-democratic a document to serve democratic purposes reliably. And his argument is that if we want to make it genuinely and lastingly democratic, we have to change Article 5 and empower ourselves to become, in his words, founders over and over and not just inheritors so that we don't have this tyranny of the past kind of lording over us and our way of life and our understanding of society today. Now, his specific suggestion is that we have a constitutional convention in every generation. And, you know, he has he has a ton of specifics in here about who would go to it, how they would discuss and kind of a two stage process where state, local or regional versions would get their results together. And then that would go into a national convention and then that would propose constitutional constitutional changes. And then you'd have a national referendum on it. So that's kind of his process. How does that line up? with your vision for reform to Article 5 and kind of the mechanism that we should be using to update the Constitution? Well, it's quite clear. We, we ground our book in what we call Washington's Middle Way. Washington and the other, fo- the other founding fathers clearly envisioned that formal constitutional change would be relatively frequent. We argued that they saw it as a cornerstone of, of the document which they were drafting. And you know, you can plot the founding fathers kind of on a spectrum about how common they thought constitutional change would occur. Jefferson famously remarked that he thought that all law should expire every generation and that thus in a, in a similar fashion, you know, every generation would need to reconstitute the body politic. Madison, for example, thought that uh, you know, f- relatively frequent constitutional change was dangerous that we should go back to the motherboard, as it were, quite rarely, mm-hmm. yet in these settled ways, in his words, where there are sufficient constitutional regulations. Washington was really in the middle. He argued that the Constitution as drafted should be obligatory and binding on all until it was changed by, in his words, an explicit and authentic act of the people. And so we argue that we should be charting a course down this middle way, that the Constitution, that there there can be good elements to tradition, as it were, that history can teach, you know, can have a good calming force to the modern day, but that the people should be empowered to change the regime when necessary through, as Washington said, explicit and authentic acts. And so our our proposed reform to Article 5 would, would make those explicit and authentic acts both easier and more popular. Uh, and and make make it such that the people are voting on that the people are one debating formal constitutional change as a first order matter and also acting on it in a first order matter. That says much in the article that you uh, talked about that is good, but I, this is a caution, which is you know we as Peter just said we believe there needs to be a much more popular role in constitutional amendment, but that doesn't mean majority vote all the time. And so that's a real, we believe in some kind of supermajority. Otherwise, it's not a constitution. It's just whatever a majority of people think at one time. What becomes of rights, human rights, if it can be decided by a majority vote? You notice during the Katanji Brown Jackson here, Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana kept saying, don't you think the people should just decide this? Don't you think the people should just decide this? Well, think about what that means. That means any time majority of people want to take away people's free speech or right to choose, a majority can do it. And that is not the idea of constitutionalism. So, yes, it needs to be easier, but it also can't be too easy. And so I think that's why people, Peter and George Washington, talked about a middle way. And we propose in the book, you know, there are a lot of mechanisms you could go. The article you mentioned discussing, you know, all these different relationships with different conventions. There are other mechanisms that we discuss at the end of our book that can provide um, kind of a calming element to amendment, making it such that uh, 
you, you put checks and balances in place that, that control the process to make sure that, it, that fundamental law, as Russ just said, remains fundamental, uh, that it's above the, the, um, the waves of, of partisan and everyday, you know, everyday partisan politics that allows the constitution to remain uh, the guiding force and fundamental, uh, gra fundamental ground to our law that it is today. You know, it, I'm, I, I'm struck by the irony that um, of our current political situation and the fact that we're facing threats from two opposite directions trying to achieve the same ends. Um, we are, we're living in a, um, a, a time of political tribalism and dysfunction. Uh, the rise of autocracy, the threat of fascism is real in America. We've seen a violent attempt to overthrow essentially our election system. And we have the far right, um, as you've laid out, basically saying, let's hit the reset button on the whole Constitution and figure out uh, uh, we don't really need this federal government. It's really just a it's it's really more a nuisance than 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 necessary. And on the other hand, we're living under a cabal of strict originalists on the Supreme Court to tell us we can't have gun safety laws because there's a comma in the Second Amendment, and they cite a 17th century English judge and 13th century English common law to tell us there is no protection for personal freedom and privacy in the Constitution. It's 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 like mythological Scylla and Charybdis um, that our democracy is trying to navigate through. Um, why? Why does the right wing need a constitutional convention when they've already got a six member majority on the Supreme Court who'll do whatever they want, they want them to do. Well, my guess is they see the demographics of this country and they see the future. And although they have the upper hand now, uh, they know that as time passes, uh, it may be harder and harder for them to string together a malapportioned legislatures, electoral colleges, and they may just not be able to do that anymore. And so the ultimate tool, the, the live weapon, as uh, Senator, former Senator Santorum says, is to lock it into the Constitution so it becomes exceedingly difficult to undo. I, that's why I think these big funders, I don't think they're just trying to put pressure. I think they really want to change the fundamental document to protect what is going to be an ever more minority uh, part of our country. There's a lot of solace in the fact that the Constitution is indeed hard to amend. And so if you are able to achieve the goal, uh, you can set in stone uh, a particular reframing of government and, and even the nature of our public life for generations. The, hey, well, then, why don't we just do it back to them? It's because it's malapportioned. And because it's so tilted in one direction, it wouldn't be like, okay, now we're going to do it to you guys. That is, it would be exceedingly difficult if it's not based on population, but only based on a state-by-state -state, uh, system, which is how the uh, how these folks like to try to argue the convention mechanism should work. So it sounds like, you know, why take the risk going through one of the three standing branches of government when you can essentially just rewrite the whole foundation? It does kind of lead me to a question, though, about the status of the three standing branches of government, because as we record this last night on 60 Minutes, they interviewed Denver Riggleman, a former uh, fairly right wing member of the U.S. House of Representatives and a former staffer on the January 6th committee. And he said, quoting here, what really shook me was the fact that if Clarence, Clarence Thomas, agreed with or was even aware of his wife, Ginny Thomas's efforts all three branches of government would be tied to the Stop the Steal movement. And I think what really stood out about that was the fact that he's saying that the ultra-right wing had and has already infiltrated and indeed in cases taken over the very top echelons of all three branches of our government. And in our last show, Jonathan Rauch of The Atlantic laid out just how deadly a Trump second term would be because it would conceivably lead to the collapse of the entire judicial branch. 
as a check and balance on the other functions, the other branches of the government. So I guess I just want to zoom out to a 30,000 foot level, not just this push to re remake the constitution, but as you look more broadly at all of these right-wing efforts to infiltrate and overtake the branches of our government, how bad is it? How worried are you about what the next two years and the next five years are going to look like? Well, I'm extremely worried. And it's obviously one of the reasons these midterm elections are so critical for the future of our democracy. I mean, the good news is, uh, from my point of view, of course, the presidency is not in the hands of these folks. Uh, neither houses of the Congress are in the hands of these folks right now, although they have been in the past. The judiciary is, at least the Supreme Court, although I would not label the majority on the Supreme Court as exactly the same as these people. I think, mm. I think it would be as, as upset as I am with the Supreme Court. I'm not ready to go there, despite what you said about Clarence Thomas. Trouble is, the midterms could change this dramatically. Uh, and it's one of the reasons we're very worried about this convention issue. And frankly, 2024 could change it as well. Maybe people will think about what it would be like if that happened when they vote, both in 2022 and 2024, do you really want the people behind these efforts who are intertwined to have all the levers? Uh, it would be extremely dangerous and it is not unthinkable that they could achieve that. So let me, let me come, this is a question really from a, I think from a different angle. It's a, it's looking at, let's call it the positive side of constitutional conventions. Um, Senator, to most Americans, you are associated with the campaign finance law that bears your name. 12 years ago, in its infinite wisdom, the Supreme Court ruled basically that money is speech. Corporations and people, corporations and other outside groups can spend unlimited money on elections. It's been a total unmitigated disaster. So without a constitutional convention uh, and with no meaningful way to pass constitutional amendments in today's political climate, how do we fix fundamental problems like this, especially given the tribalism and dysfunction we're experiencing in our problems? How do we, how do we fix the fundamental problems? Well, it's exceedingly difficult to, to fix it in the current environment, given the paralysis in Congress and the fact that the court uh, felt that it could basically make up an idea that it could strike down a 1907 law prohibiting corporations from getting involved in elections. So one way to undo it, of course, is to overturn Citizens United, but that's not going to happen anytime soon with this court. Uh, yes, a constitutional amendment uh, to overturn it, uh, in my view, would be great if it could be done. Uh, but it's exceedingly unlikely to occur. And so, you know, I can give you a long presentation about the things Congress can do to make it better. They can pass, uh, you and I have worked on these issues, such as, you know, vouchers that people could have voluntarily for elections that has worked in places like Seattle and New York City. You can give real teeth to enforcement of what's supposed to be the independence of the corporate giving and the politicians, which of course is not real. You could have a actual enforcement agency. The Federal Elections Commission is kind of a joke because it's deadlocked. It could become an actual, McCain and I used to propose that. So I think there are things you can do. The trouble is right now, it's very hard to, to make that happen. Peter? Well, just again, to say that this is why we end the book the way we do, thinking about reform to Article 5. Uh, it, it's, it, it's exceptionally important in the modern era for the people to be able to change the, the constitution through settled procedures that are democratic in nature, but also safe, that there's, con there's consensus about how the procedure actually should function in practice. And so the goal of the book ultimately is to spark a public debate about the future of both the constitution and formal constitutional change in public life. And that's why we propose the formation of a bipartisan congressional committee that would look intently at this issue and draft a revision to Article 5 for ratification. Because 
we need formal constitutional change to address some of these, these core issues like campaign finance or uh, equipping the federal government to address existential crises like climate change. Uh, and so we hope that the book will have that impact and that we can begin having this national debate that is essential. One of the things that's a dilemma for hosts like us when we want to feature books that we think are important like yours is we want our listeners and our viewers to get a sense of what's in the book, what the issues are, to kind of get excited about it. But we don't want them to leave their listening or their viewing and saying, well, I got it now. I don't need to read the book. And as Professor Sabato said in that quote that Paul uh, extracted from earlier, he actually wants everyone to read this book and get a sense of mission like you clearly have about the importance of this issue and this stealth effort to undermine and, and remake the fundamentals of our constitution. So I, I just wanted to invite both of you. You've done a ton of historical analysis, research, work on the core fund fundamental constitutional issues involved. I just I want to give you the opportunity to tease something that stood out to you in the course of all of that research, in the course of all of that that work that made you shake your head, that you you got really into as you were writing the book, that people will find when they crack this open, when they buy it and then crack it open. I, what stood out that you, you'd like people to say, oh, I, I want to read about that? Well, for me, and I think Peter probably feels similarly, is, is understanding that this whole idea of amending the Constitution was really on the minds of the people in this country, even prior to the revolution, after the revolution between the Articles of Confederation and, and the convention where they came up with Article 5, that they were really trying to do something unique. Yes, there were French philosophers and others and English philosophers who talked about things like this, but they were the first ones to really put it into practice. And so the founders were in a tough situation. They had to come up with a document. You know, Benjamin Franklin pointed out that, you know, they, they were not exactly at a, a, you know, at a seaside resort. He famously said, we better hang together or we will surely hang separately. So, you know, we don't want to be overly critical, but they did put this thing together that could still explode, even though it was a genuine attempt to create bloodless revolution. And then we lay out in the book the various times when people have tried to use the convention mechanism not for bad purposes, but to try to make the country better. So that history, I think, is not only fun to read, but important so that think people think about this in a nuanced way. It's yes, you don't want the right wing to be able to undo the Constitution in a terrible way. But yes, the founders wanted us to be able to change it. Precisely. I think we argue in the book that over the last five decades, maybe the last century, a founding ethos has been lost. And we attempted to unearth this kind of founding ideal in, in, the, in the early parts of the book that the founding generation and the framers of the federal constitution, it's quite clear that they saw constitutional amendment as the cornerstone of the American democratic experiment. It would be the mechanism that would allow the, 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 the fledgling democracy to endure. There's this fascinating anecdote that, that we, we uh, cite quite liberally in the book because it's just so interesting. George Washington uh, didn't want to go to the 1787 Constitutional Convention. He, he was happy farming uh, and he had you know, retired from public life, but he went because he had, he had fears that the, that the young, country was failing. There was, there was um, unrest in Massachusetts and the government couldn't, uh, couldn't address it. And the federal government under the Articles of Confederation was, uh, was incredibly inept. And he goes to the convention, which he doubted its legality, which I think is fascinating. And then when it adjourns, he tells his fellow citizens that the document as drafted was flawed, but he encouraged them to adopt it, to ratify the constitution because it could be changed. And that is really this, this foundational belief that we need to rekindle in the modern era. The constitution is a great document. It has guided our political life uh, with, remark with remarkable stability, but it's not a perfect document. And we need to rekindle that, Washington's, that Washingtonian middle way that we should have these explicit and authentic acts for the modern people 
to reform the constitutional regime. The book is The Constitution in Jeopardy from former U.S. Senator Russ Feingold, Peter Prindeville. Thanks so much for being on Beyond Politics. Thank you. It was fun. Thanks for having us.